Danny Fallon. <laughs> Filming a comedy special. <laughs> First one. Hope I don't fuck it up. <laughs> you know? Just say something stupid right off the rip. <laughs> Throw away all that hard work. <laughs> it's all right. I can always just kill myself. <laughs> you know? That's how you maintain control in this absurd existence. Just remind yourself, you always have the power to take your own life. At any point, you know? That's how you relax yourself during the day. You're like, I could kill myself, or I could just vacuum my room, work back from there. You know? Yeah. I'm actually working on my suicide letter, actually. I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. But just in case that moment comes, I don't want to be clogged up with paperwork. <laughs> you know? Because I think it's important if you're going to take your own life, you know, leave behind a letter, a note, some piece of literature to ensure your family and friends that in fact it was their fault. <laughs> you know? Don't leave any mystery to it. But it's tough, man. I'm an artist, so I want to nail it. That's terrible. Like, I think the saddest part about writing a suicide letter is you can't send it to anyone for edits. <laughs> Like, hey, does this capture my voice? Because I never know where to put the commas. Use an incorrect semicolon, now I'm illiterate and a coward. You know. I don't know. I, don't know, I try to be positive, you know, but other positive people make it hard because they're stupid. You know? Like, a lot of positive people will say things like, uh, everything happens for a reason. You hear that a lot. Everything happens for a reason. I think that's true to some extent, but I think sometimes the reason isn't as profound as people give it credit for. Like sometimes the reason is just, you didn't take your antipsychotic, Susan. <laughs> yeah, you got Baker acted because you're a crazy person. <laughs> Not because of your journey. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the reason you got herpes it's because you had sex with a person who has herpes. It's not God giving his toughest battles to his toughest soldiers. You're just a whore, Sharon. Which is fine, I love whores, so. You know. I know, I try to be positive in like a realistic kind of way. You know, try to find the silver lining to tough situations. Because life is filled with tough situations, you know. Like, I got a friend, he's in a wheelchair, and he gave me a call recently, and then I didn't answer because I don't like him. <laughs> but he left me a voicemail, so I listened to the voicemail, and uh, on the voicemail he said, Danny, I got some bad news. And I thought to myself, well, I know one thing it isn't. <laughs> you can't get paralyzed twice. <laughs> you know? That's glass half full. <laughs> or in this case, body half full. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, like, you know, life doesn't always go as planned. You know, like, I didn't always want to be a comedian. I wanted to be a rock star. You guys remember having dreams? <laughs> There's a famous quote by a famous rock star. It's, uh, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. That's John Lennon. He also beat his first wife, so. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, sometimes white beaters have some good shit to say, you know? <laughs> Maybe don't throw the baby out with the wife beater, you know? Because I wanted to be a rock star. That was my first dream in life, you know? I grew up in Indiana. I paid attention. I thought I had the formula down. I thought I cracked the case. I was like, if I just own some instruments and do a shit ton of drugs, I'll definitely become a rock star, right? <laughs> Turns out that just makes you a drug addict. 
So I sold the instruments to buy more drugs. <laughs> Might as well double down on your strengths in life, you know? <laughs> Focus on what you're good at. My parents tried to warn me. I was like, hey, mom and dad, I'm gonna skip college, move out to Los Angeles, make it big with my garage band. My dad, he was a bit of a hard ass. He was like, son, if you wanna do that, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna end up strung out on drugs, sucking dick for crack. And I was like, I'm gonna show you, you're wrong. And then I moved out there and I was like, you're right. <laughs> yeah, gay for the pay. Anyone else live a full life? <laughs> it's all right though, you know, some people go to college, some people do drugs. You learn a lot from doing a lot of drugs. Like I learned that if your drug dealer shows up on a children's bicycle, <laughs> that's gonna be some bad weed. <laughs> But if your drug dealer shows up on a children's bicycle, that's gonna be some grade A heroin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I used to be a heroin addict. That's pretty, uh, pretty terrible addiction, pretty horrible addiction. Like I haven't done heroin over eight years and even all these years later, I still get these intense cravings to remind people I used to do heroin. <laughs> It's like my whole personality. I'll meet someone at a party like, oh, you're an accountant? I used to be a heroin addict. I'm sure we have a lot in common. Oh, you're an accountant? You work with numbers? I used to army crawl into my mom's room to steal $20 out of her purse. Same, same, but different, you know? Uh, a lot of my friends are ex-heroin addicts, which, yeah, which statistically shouldn't be possible, but <laughs> thanks to the wonderful city of Delray Beach, Florida, we all get to meet each other, hang out with each other, fuck each other, make more heroin addict babies, <laughs> ship them out, wait till they come back, you know? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I've noticed that a lot of ex-heroin addicts like to work out, like including myself. <laughs> and we like to get into working out, which I think is good, you know, it's a good replacement for all of our self-destructive tendencies. But I know the real reason why ex-heroin addicts like myself love working out. We just wanna work out for long enough to finally get all of our veins back. <laughs> so when we inevitably relapse, we actually have somewhere to shoot up this time. <laughs> I'm almost there, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> uh, drug culture is changing, though. Uh, I read an article recently. They're saying that they're using ketamine now to treat depression. Yeah, I read the article. They're saying that if you inject a patient with ketamine, it'll immediately reverse suicidal ideation, which I knew that shit back in 2012. <laughs> And no one was applauding me for breaking scientific ground. <laughs> they were just like, Dan, you're scaring grandma. <laughs> also, I don't feel like it was really that complex of an idea to figure out. All they're really saying is, hey, maybe if you get high as shit, you won't want to kill yourself. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Also, if you've ever done ketamine, it's kind of like you already did kill yourself. You can't speak, you can't move, you don't know your name. It's like a 30 minute free trial on suicide. Yeah, the logic here is like, yeah, you know what helps you not murder? A little murder as a treat. Murder somebody the first Tuesday of the month, I don't murder nobody else. The whole rest of the month. Because I used to do a lot of drugs, uh, a lot of people will ask me drug questions. They see me as like a drug expert. People are like, Dan, you used to do a lot of drugs. What's the best drug to do at the DMV? That's a question I get a lot. And the answer is magic mushrooms. Because people always complain about how much time it takes at the DMV. You take magic mushrooms, you're like, dude, what is time? And also, what are these, huh? used to love taking ecstasy. 
That was my favorite drug of all time. I love taking ecstasy. I always thought ecstasy was a great party drug. That's what I always thought. Of course, no one else at my nephew's fourth birthday party thought so. <laughs> I just showed up vibe and I was like, yeah, this Frozen soundtrack slaps, bro. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and put my hands in the birthday cake. <laughs> so blue and smooth. They're like, Dan, get your hands out of the birthday cake, man. Dan, the pacifiers are for the children. <laughs> Not for your <laughs> jaw. Yeah. Yeah, that one does require an inside knowledge of MDMA, and that's okay. <laughs> My jokes aren't for everyone. It's just usually people from broken homes, so. I remember the first time I ever did ecstasy. I was over at my buddy Paul Lucas's house. You guys remember him? Oh, Paul. Yeah, so that's his full legal name. Be sure to look him up after the show. I was over at Paul's house and uh, what had happened was I had, a, I had a friend and he was a drug dealer because all my friends back then were drug dealers. And uh, he told me about this new product on the market. It was called Molly MDMA ecstasy in its purest form, you know? And he was like, listen, you're in a band. You're trying to make it as like a musician. You're going to want to try Molly because it's going to like uh, boost your creativity. It's going to expand your consciousness. And listen, I didn't need a lot of convincing to try a new drug. <laughs> I mean, I lost my virginity on Trazodone, so. <laughs> That's a sleeping pill, so. <laughs> I was a very sleepy virgin. It was consensual, don't worry. Uh, So I bought the two Molly capsules for my friend and I was planning on saving them for like a jam session with my band. But I don't know if you know anything about drug addicts. Yeah. We're not too good at holding on to drugs. <laughs> so I ended up doing them on like a Tuesday morning <laughs> after community college, you know. I was over at Paul's house and we were smoking weed and weed wasn't really my favorite drug, you know. Weed made me too paranoid. Like at the end of me using drugs, I'd be shooting up heroin Someone would offer me a joint, I'd be like, hey, miss me with that shit, bro. A little too strong for my taste. That's gonna make me think. I don't want that. Because weed made me paranoid, you know? I like other drugs. Other drugs make you paranoid, but at least it's fun. Crystal meth makes you paranoid, but it's exciting. You get paranoid meth, you're like, oh my God, the cops are coming. They're gonna be any second, they're gonna come to that door, so you know what I should do? I should masturbate for 12 hours. <laughs> that way when the cops get here, I don't impregnate them. Oh that's fun, that's a good time. Uh, weed paranoia, that's dark, you know? I smoke weed, I just have dark thoughts, just like. <sighs> Dude, I think Uncle Ronnie molested me. <sighs> Thanksgiving is always so weird, you know? It's definitely a vibe there. This weed is like the ghost of Christmas past. So, you know, we were hanging out at Paul's and we were smoking weed and it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't that great, you know? So I had these Molly capsules in my pocket and I, you know, I decided I wanted to change the channel on the TV a little bit. So I take one Molly capsule and I don't know if you've ever done Molly before, not a super manageable drug to be on for the first time around someone else who's not on Molly. <laughs> you know, just sitting there trying to watch TV, just like. <laughs> Seinfeld is riveting, man. <laughs> I'm gonna fuck your couch, dude. <laughs> I could tell the drugs were kicking in because I started doodling a picture of his pool with a crayon on a piece of white computer paper. Like, and in my head, I felt like Picasso, you know? Just like sculpting a masterpiece, beads of sweat running down my face. But from Paul's perspective, what he saw looked more like an autistic child had night terrors. <laughs> and just like hurled a crayon at a piece of paper which prompted Paul to ask me, 
dude, did you take some additional drugs? I said, yeah, I did a little Molly. He's like, you ever do Molly before? I said, no. He's like, dude, we gotta get the fuck out of here. My mom's coming home. But you got any more? So we split the last capsule, 40-60. Standard protocol. You know? And it was a good call on Paul's for us to leave his house, you know? Because Paul came from a very religiously furnished household, you know? A lot of religious memorabilia all over the place. You know, like Jesus on the cross, St. Paul in the bathroom, disciple baseball cards. You know, not the place you want to be the first time you're rolling dick on ecstasy. <laughs> Paul was Greek Orthodox. You guys familiar with religion? For those of you who don't know, Greek Orthodox, it's basically the same thing as Catholic, except for they don't fuck kids. Seriously, seriously, back in the day, all the modern-day Christian religions were actually one unified religion under the Byzantine Empire. And then the modern-day portion of Catholics were like, hey, we want to have sex with little boys. Can we write that in there somewhere? And everyone else was like, ew, gross, no. And Catholics were like, well, we're going to do it anyhow, so... Everyone else was like, all right, well, we're fucking leaving, you know? They broke off in, like, the Protestants, the Lutherans, the Later Day Saints. Uh, similar trajectory to the Jackson Five, really. <laughs> if you think about it, you know? <laughs> Michael Jackson being the Catholic Church in this analogy. <laughs> because he's the most well-known. And little boys, so... <laughs> I understand, I understand that joke can be offensive to some people, so I just want to apologize to any of the Jewish people here tonight who didn't know what the fuck was going on. Do we have any Jewish people here tonight? Yeah. Nice. Shouldn't out yourself. That's how they always get you, so. Keep that to yourself next time, you know? Play it smart, you know? Play it smart. Things are crazy right now, you know? Keep that, you know. Anyhow, I'm not going to go all Kanye on you guys. Uh, try, to, try to put a special on YouTube, you know? Anyhow, so we left Paul's house because he was Greek Orthodox. Um, you know? But, you know, my buddy who sold me the drugs didn't lie. I mean, the shit was making me really creative. So before we left, I grabbed a marker, you know? So we leave, we're on bicycles, we're rolling around, and, and uh, I didn't bring any paper with me. So I had to keep track of all my, I, I had all these like, great ideas flowing through me, you know? You know how it is when you're on drugs, you know? You figure everything out. <laughs> so I had these like tight khaki pants on, and I just started filling them up with like all my great ideas. Like I was just like, here's a movie, I'm a, here's a movie script, I'm gonna make a movie someday. Here's a rock album about ecstasy. Uh, here's a man on ecstasy. Here's just an ecstasy pill, because I love this shit. This is amazing. My pants just look like a psych ward patient doodled on them, you know? Just the graffiti of all my great ideas, you know? And so it was your pretty standard Indiana ecstasy trip, you know? We smoked weed with a man who's now schizophrenic in a church parking lot. I won't say his legal name. Um, at one point, I realized that life was water. Paul agreed. <laughs> so I went ahead and added that to the list. <laughs> so the trip goes on and on, and we find ourselves back at Paul's house. His mom had left, you know? And I found myself in the bathroom alone. You know, a place I find myself a lot. And, uh, you know, I think I know what I went in there to do. You know, 19 years old, high on a new drug for the first time. I think I know. I was looking at myself in the mirror. I was feeling kind of sexy. <laughs> had my shirt off, had a belt around my chest, just vibing. <laughs> I was like, dude, I want to do this drug every day for the rest of my life. And I tried, but... But then I had what people describe as a moment of clarity. All of a sudden I was like, shit, Danny, the drugs have gotten you sidetracked from your dreams. 
You're supposed to move to Los Angeles, make it big with your garage band, make it big in showbiz. Now you're taking ecstasy, hanging out with Paul Lucas, going to community college? You gotta get your shit together. <laughs> but then as soon as I had the first thought, a second, darker thought crushed down upon me. It was the Molly now. I was like, dude, Danny, if you wanna move to Los Angeles and make it big in showbiz, you're definitely gonna have to do gay porn. <laughs> I was like, no, there's got to be another way. But the Molly was calling the shots. It's like, yeah, no, you got to do gay porn. <laughs> and at this point, for some reason, I was crawling around on the ground. I don't know what it is about drugs, but I always find myself on my knees. <laughs> and I'm down there, and I'm like, I have this moment with myself where I'm like, you know what? What better place than here? Oh my God. High in ecstasy for the first time with St. Paul on the wall, staring down in disgust. What better place than here to find out if I have the emotional, spiritual, and most importantly, physical capacity for gay porn. Yeah. And it was at that moment I noticed a wooden plunger. I was like, yeah, that'll do. So, you know, I start to jerk it off. I'm like, yeah, I could pretend to be into that, you know, I could. I was like, no, you fool, no one's gonna pay you just to jerk dicks off. That's not a real job, you know what you have to do. So I stood up, I looked at myself in the mirror, loosened my belt, lowered my pants, all of my great ideas crumbled to the floor. And, I looked, at, and I, I looked at myself and I braced myself. And at this point, it was no longer a theoret theoretical situation. I was completely gone. I was in LA. I was on the casting couch. The agents were there. The managers were there. They're like, we're going to put your name in lights. The movie's going to go big. The album's going to go platinum. Just jam this wooden plunger into your ass, man. And then I blacked out. Yeah, I have no concrete recollection of what happened next. But I'm pretty sure the basic gist of it is, I molested my asshole with a wooden plunger. <laughs> so now when people ask me why I don't do drugs anymore, I just tell them, I don't like splinters, man. It's a fun story, family friendly, for sure. I wish it was true, you know? I mean, the plunger part's true, for sure, but... I, w I just wish it was enough for me to actually get sober, you know? It had to get much worse. The plungers got bigger. And vainier. It's all right, I went to rehab. I went to rehab three times, just to make sure. <laughs> it's crazy, because I started working in rehab. And my only qualification for working in rehab was just the fact that I went to rehab three times. Yes. Which made me realize rehab is a bit of a pyramid scheme. <laughs> if you think about it, you know? Because like I went to rehab, then I started working in rehab helping other people get sober so one day, maybe they could work in a rehab too. That dynamic doesn't exist in other medical fields, you know? You're not leaving the psych ward for the third time. And they're like, you know what? You're pretty crazy. You wanna start working here? We could really use your mind. Get inside the enemies. Dude, at one point in my life, I wasn't even out of rehab and I was working at a different rehab. <laughs> I would ride my bicycle from my rehab where I slept to another rehab where I was in charge. <laughs> That's insane. That'd be like if a guy was on work release and he was a corrections officer at a different prison. <laughs> I did clean up though, I uh, 
I've actually been clean and sober now since October 6, 2014, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's awesome how people will clap for something you should have been doing the whole time in your life. <laughs> Not smoking crystal meth and sleeping in trash cans. But I'll take it, you know? I need it. It's made me realize I have a much different value system than most people, you know? Because most people, they count their success in life by how long they've actually done something productive. And me, I'm constantly measuring my success in life by how long I've abstained from a bad behavior. Like I was on the phone with my friend Zoe, she's like, it's wild. I've been married to John now for five years. Kids turning three. I'm like, that's great, I haven't stolen anything from Walmart this month, so. Doing all right. He's yeah. talking to my older brother. He's crushing in life. He works on Wall Street. He called me up. He's like, Dan, I just got a promotion at the firm. I'm like, nice. I just got off probation and I can't stay firm. <laughs> yeah, I still don't understand how me and my older brother came from the same household, you know? It's like he got all the autism and he's really good at math problems, and I got dad's alcoholism and had a really bad math problem. You know? Just gotta play the cards you're dealt. My dad, uh, he actually called me recently because he found out about microdosing. Microdosing, for those of you who don't know, that's that new trend amongst like millennials and Gen Zers where they're taking like microscopic doses of LSD and magic mushrooms to treat their anxiety so they don't have a panic attack when they make a TikTok. <laughs> when I was a young man, we preferred macrodosing. That's where you take like a heroic dose of mushrooms, <laughs> then lock yourself in the basement with the family computer to watch gay porn for six hours. So you can decide once and for all whether or not I am. You know, or when you take like six to eight hits of LSD at your buddy JoJo's house to find out the secrets of the universe, only to find out one of the secrets of the universe is that trees can talk and they think you have a little dick. You know, you know, or when you like blast off on DMT at your buddy Sebastian Bocanegros who actually died drowning in the YMCA pool doing unsupervised Wim Hof breathing exercises. But at the time, he was just a friend trying to help you quit heroin. So you blast off on DMT to find God and kill him, only get scared halfway there and chicken out. You know, macrodosing. <laughs> you guys remember. You guys remember. But my father, he found out about microdosing, right? So he gave me a call. He's like, Danny, I think I'm going to do microdosing. I said, wow, 360 from my childhood, but all right. He's like, yeah, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go buy Xanax off the street. I'm going to crush it up, slip it in your mother's coffee for two weeks. That way, maybe she'll be a better person. I was like, Jesus Christ, Dad, that's not microdosing. That's the reason Bill Cosby was in jail. Speaking of uh, comedians trying to have sex with people, uh, I've been trying to get back out there myself, so. Uh, yeah, I didn't really want the pity fucking, uh, <laughs> the pity applause. That's like, that's like a pity fuck, you know? No one likes a pity fuck. I'll take a pity fuck. Um, I'll take it any, I don't know. I, uh, it's kind of hard to date when you don't drink anymore. You know, it's kind of also hard to date when you have erectile dysfunction, but. Well, maybe not hard. That was <laughs> poor choice words. I got ED, dude. Yeah, I caught it early. I caught it in my early 20s. That's a little early. But I think it's because my dick has an old soul, so. <laughs> He's just trying to wear sweaters. <laughs> Read the Grapes of Wrath. It's all right, they make pills for it, you know, so if anybody wants to fuck, uh, just give me 30 minutes prior notice. It's like an easy bake oven, I gotta warm it up. It's pretty crazy, I used to take pills to get fucked up, now I just take pills to get it up. Life is all about growth, so. 
Dude, I love this job, dude. This is the only job I've ever had in my life where I can just openly solicit sex. I used to work at McDonald's. You can't do that there. <laughs> like, hey, you want a number one? You want to suck my dick? <laughs> what do you think about that, huh? <laughs> Supersize that, huh? <laughs> I, actually, I actually did get solicited for sex myself at one job. Oh. Yeah. I, uh, my first sexual experience ever in life was getting blown by my boss from Subway, <laughs> who was a dude. For $70 and a couple Vicodin. <laughs> Seemed worth it at the time. I got high for the day. But now I got PTSD. <laughs> now every time I get a blowjob in life, all I can think about is Subway, eat fresh. <laughs> Six inch, extra mayonnaise. <laughs> hey, you just had to hear it. I had to live it, so. <laughs> he had a beard, too, so. No amount of Xanax will make you forget that memory. <laughs> what was I talking about? Erectile dysfunction? Yeah. I can't see any correlation between that traumatic experience and my current situation. What? That's crazy. Who said that? I said that. This is meta. All right. I got erectile dysfunction. Yeah. It's tough, man. It's a tough disease. Just like any other disease, it comes with complications, you know? Like diabetes, you might have like high cholesterol. Erectile dysfunction, the number one complication is LOP, loss of pussy. <laughs> I remember I had this one very specific incident of LOP. I worked in an office, and I had this crush on this chick that worked there. She was so hot. She was a MILF. That's dope. I love MILFs, Whoa. you know? Because I have unresolved mommy issues. <laughs> so I like cooking them with MILFs because they'll say things to me that my mom never said to me growing up. Like, hey. <laughs> Like, hey, nice cock, kid. <laughs> or, I love you, Danny. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just playing around. My mom told me I have a nice cock, so. <laughs> yeah. So we ended up at this MILF's house on the weekend, you know? She got a babysitter or something. And I was being all awkward. I'm an awkward guy. I didn't know how to make a move. But she had that, like, New York charm, so she smoothed it over. She was just like, so you want me to suck your dick? Well, no. Nah. I was like, damn, aggressive. But you know what? Get over here, Jada Kiss. But then it didn't work. You know how tough it is to walk past somebody on Monday who's had your flaccid penis in their mouth on Saturday? Terrible. <laughs> Trying to talk to her about work stuff. I'm like, hey, can you email me that spreadsheet? She's like, I can't get it up. <laughs> I was like, come on. She's like, you wish. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. You know, people say this. People say, uh, I like my women like I like my coffee. You know, like hot and black or creamy and blonde. I feel like I don't relate to that at all. I feel like I'll take my women or my coffee however I can get it. <laughs> Usually for free. <laughs> At a 12-step meeting. <laughs> Hotness may vary. It's definitely gonna be bitter. <laughs> and it definitely was made by people who were on drugs. Trying to find a girlfriend for the last uh, couple of years, 29 years. Who's counting, huh? Uh, I feel like trying to find a girlfriend is kind of like shopping for a new car. Except for I got like a used car budget, you know? Being 5'10", ex-heroin addict, limp dick. I'm more in the used car budget zone. Because I'll find one, I'll be like, oh man, look at this, perfect exterior, great paint job. Then I get inside, I'm like, Smells kind of weird in here, huh? <laughs> All right, time to move on to the next one. Not the best exterior in this one. It's got a few nicks, a few scratches. But hey, it's got a certain rugged lovability to it. 
sure I could learn to love it. <laughs> then I check under the hood. I'm like, a lot of miles. A <laughs> lot of miles on the car. And listen, I'm not judging the car for having a lot of miles. I'm just saying, based on prior experience, there could be some issues moving forward. <laughs> Fluids might get lower more often, you know? Might feel like I'm fucking the inside of a toilet paper roll. I don't know. <laughs> not sure. And honestly, a car with that many miles could have been a rental. That's a prostitute joke, so. At this point, man, I'm like, to hell with the whole thing. Yeah. My roommate's got a girlfriend. I'm thinking about just asking him if we can carpool. <laughs> Both going the same place. <laughs> What's funny about that joke is I actually, I actually wrote that joke two roommates ago. <laughs> but I just keep living with men who find the love of their life while they're living with me. <laughs> it's like that movie, you ever seen that movie with Dane Cook? It's called Good Luck Chuck. It's like in that movie, if a woman has sex with Dan Cook's character, afterwards, they find the love of their life. I'm like that, but as a roommate. Like, if you live with me, you'll find the love of your life. I'm like the Good Luck Cuck. I don't know. I'm open. I'm open to finding love, you know? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough, you know? Like, uh, I think it's tough nowadays. Uh, there's all this, like, it's, it's too much, you know? Like, there's too many things, you know? Like, there's, like, Bumble and Tinder and, and all this shit. Like, uh, you know, like, back in the day, it used to be a very simple idea. It used to be like, uh, all right, I'm just going to find someone, uh, maybe a church or something. It doesn't even matter if I really like them. I'm just going to commit to them. I'm never going to give up on them, even if I fucking hate them. But <laughs> enough about my parents, huh? <laughs> Like, I struggle, I struggle with love. Like, you know, uh, it used to be easier for me to fall in love. I used to be homeless. <laughs> so it's kind of easier to fall in love, you know? My bar was lower, you know? <laughs> fall in love with a woman, she had a car. <laughs> you know? But now I feel like the pendulum has swung too far to the other direction, you know? Like, I was on the couch with my ex-girlfriend. We didn't even call each other boyfriend and girlfriend at the time. You ever be in a relationship like that? You don't even realize you're dating until after you break up, and you're like, I guess this we were dating is what this was, huh? <laughs> we finally are able to use the labels once it's over. <laughs> yeah, we're fucked up. Um, <laughs> but I was on the couch with my ex-girlfriend, and uh, she brought up the show BoJack Horseman, which is a show that I absolutely love, right? I love that show more than most things in life, and that's what I wanted to tell her. But when I opened my mouth, I pulled an audible. I was like, oh, Bojack? I loik. I loik that show. <laughs> because I was terrified of even expressing that I'm capable of loving anything around her. <laughs> I was terrified to even say the word love while in her vicinity. I didn't want her to get any big ideas, you know? Oh, he loves Bojack. Maybe he'll love me someday. Can't have that. <laughs> But it was all right, she had a good sense of humor, you know, so it became like a running joke in the relationship. It was like, hey, I more than like you, I like you. <laughs> it was cool, it was cute, it was a way for us to get around saying it. And then nine months later, she's like, hey Danny, I love you. And I was like, oh baby, I would like to see other people. <laughs> no, I didn't say that, that's crazy. That would be, that would make me a monster. I just said, uh, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. <laughs> Which is much worse. <laughs> I said, it's not you, it's me. I'm a closeted homosexual. <laughs> That's why I can't maintain an erection. I'm thinking about my friend Kevin. That's what I actually said, you know? We're friends. Um, no. I don't know. Like, uh, anyone here ever use a pros and cons list to decide whether or not to stay with your partner? Yeah, yeah a couple sociopaths, all right. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's why we're all single. 
I'll tell you this much, that decision is made a lot easier if your partner finds the list. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was a tough Tuesday. <laughs> she was just rummaging around, she's like, oh, what's this? Pros, good at sex, beautiful, good listener, that's me. Cons, weird smell, <laughs> lot of miles. Would rather carpool? <laughs> what the fuck, Danny? <laughs> Breakups are tough, though, on either end, you know? Like, I think that going through a breakup is actually tougher than quitting heroin. You know, because nine months after I quit doing heroin, I wouldn't make a fake Instagram account to go creep on my ex-drug dealer's page. <laughs> Just creeping around, just trying to get my feelings hurt. <laughs> Look at that, he's wearing jeans now, that's different. <laughs> he never wore jeans when he was dealing drugs to me. <laughs> I wonder what's changed. I wonder who he's fucking. <laughs> you never run into your ex-drug dealer at the community service office and be like, listen, it wasn't you, it was me. <laughs> See, I love heroin, but I'm not in love with heroin. Oh, look at that, he got a new bike, all right. <laughs> He's doing better. This was meant to be, yeah. You ever break up with someone, you ever think you miss someone, but you really just miss their animals? Woo! Yeah. yeah, fuck yeah. yeah, fuck yeah, that was, woo, that was crazy, wow. All right, I guess we have to have sex now. I don't know how that works, pretty sure. That's crazy. All right, this joke's for you. <laughs> Damn, all right. Like I broke up with my ex and she had uh, two beautiful cats. She had Inspector Floof and Mr. Kittler. I love those cats, you know, and as a millennial, that's the closest I'm ever gonna get to having kids, so I was all heartbroken, you know, because I wasn't given visitation in the breakup. I was all heartbroken. Then I moved into this new house. I met my roommate's cat, June. I fell in love with this cat instantly. Made me forget all about Max. Yeah, this cat's the best, man. She's my little rebound pussy. <laughs> some of you don't, some of you didn't laugh. I don't fuck the cat, so. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I won't even masturbate in front of the cat, you know? I know some people do, and I don't feel like you should. <laughs> Especially if you're one of these, my animals are my children type. Not a good look. <laughs> Shut that down. I've actually been trying to adjust my masturbation habits for a long time, you know? I had quite an epic journey with masturbation, really. Um, like, where I'm at currently is I'm trying to stop watching porn. Because I think porn has gone a little too far, right? Yeah. I think we can all agree we've strayed a little too far from God's light. <laughs> Like, I saw a porn title the other day. It just said, son, mad at stepmom, fucks dad. <laughs> All right, let's see what this pervy son is up to, huh? Because I'll try anything once, you know? And then twice, just to make sure. But at one point in my life, I tried to quit uh, masturbating and watching porn. I had a friend, you know, and he was on crystal meth, and he gave me a call, and, uh, you know, because that's the type of people I listen to. <laughs> he gave me a call. He's like, crystal meth is great, but also, um, you're going to want to try this thing called NoFap out, right? It's, uh, it's like keto, but instead of avoiding carbs, you just avoid coming. It's just, you're going to quit masturbating and watching porn. I'm like, why would I do that? He's like, because you struggle with porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Pied. Which is not the type of sexual pie you're looking for, my friend. And I was like, okay, I'm listening, friend. He's like, yeah, quit masturbating, quit watching porn. It's gonna boost your creativity. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna make you uh, more desirable to women. It's gonna increase your testosterone. You know, it's gonna make you stronger. If you don't believe me, go on to Reddit, where, where all great ideas are found. And right next to the incel page and the alt-right page, there's gonna be another page called NoFap. 
So I went on there, and I started doing the research. It was just a bunch of sad, lonely dudes <laughs> encouraging each other not to jerk off anymore. Just like, retain your cum, bro. <laughs> retain your cum. <laughs> the power as a man is in your cum. <laughs> Do not spill your seed to these devilish women. <laughs> All right, I've been in a cult before. I'll try for nine months. <laughs> and I did. I tried it. I quit masturbating and watching porn for 264 days. Wow. Yeah. Please don't clap, it's not heroin. It's not good. But I learned, I learned a lot about myself. Like I learned how quitting masturbating for 264 days is a complete waste of time. I wasn't getting anything out of it. It's a little too hard to stick to. That's a cheap joke. That's on me, for sure. <laughs> but I don't know, it changed my perspective on porn, you know? Because, like, you know, you take that long of a break and then you start watching porn. I didn't watch porn, obviously, the whole time. 264 days, just, what's new on Brazzers? You know, that would be crazy. <laughs> but my perspective has changed. Like, my brain has, like, matured a little bit. Like, I used to love watching this type of porn. I would categorize, like, slutty nurse porn. That's one of these where like a guy will go into a doctor's office. He's got like a broken elbow. Then some busty nurse with a stethoscope comes out. She's like, oh my God, your elbow's broke? We should do a physical. Here's what we'll do. I'll fill up your balls. But instead of you coughing, I'll choke on your cock. Then he gets a blowjob. Then afterwards, his elbow still broke, but <laughs> at least he got a blowjob, you know? <laughs> but now I'm older. I pay for my own health insurance, you know? It's like $200 a month. So now I really can't enjoy that type of porn anymore. Like, I'll just be sitting there trying to get into it, and I'll be like, man, the copay on this visit is going to be ridiculous, huh? <laughs> I got Medicaid of Florida. This seems more like a Blue Cross Blue Shield <laughs> type procedure going on here. Yeah, I guess I just fantasize about a healthcare system where I actually enjoy getting fucked. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I don't like about porn is uh, how it depicts female orgasms, you know? They make it seem like it's this really easy, you know, thing. Like it's just like two minutes of doggy style, she's just going off like a fire hydrant. I don't know who these women are, you know, but like a lot of the women that I've hooked up with in my life, they had to use a vibrator during sex, which is not like a reflection on me or anything, just, <laughs> just the type of women I date, you know? And I remember the first time I had to hook up with a chick who had to use a vibrator during sex, it made me feel very insecure. I was like, no, you're not gonna need that when you're with me. I'm a young stud, I could definitely take care of that. And not really, you know? <laughs> Have you ever seen some of these vibrators? I mean, some of these vibrators, some of them look like mining equipment. <laughs> it looks like something you could drill to China with. And they're using this on the clitoris? I don't want to compete with that. You ever try to go down on a woman who regularly uses a vibrator? You're down there for like three hours. Your neck starts to hurt. By the end of it, you're not even sure if you're straight anymore. You're like, I think I'll just suck a dick at this point, huh? <laughs> Seems like a much more straightforward process. <laughs> at least I'll have physical evidence that the person came. <laughs> I don't just have to believe that I made them come. Because <laughs> they like my personality. You know? And listen, it's fine. I'm an open-minded lover. I don't judge. Whatever it takes for you to get off. We all got Uncle Ronnie's in our life. <laughs> you know? Like, whatever it is. BDSM, pissing, shitting, dressing up like Al-Qaeda. Whatever it is. 
Like my ex, she had to use the magic wand. I had to think about other women. <laughs> it's fine, you know? I read an article uh, that said that 80% of men think about other women during sex, and the other 20% just think about other men. <laughs> Which is not true. It's just an article I made up for the joke, but... I did that joke recently, and this chick had this reaction in the crowd. When I said the first stat, she said, oh, no, don't say that. Then when I said the second stat, she's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Sweetheart, I don't think that joke gave you the resolution you think it did. <laughs> Based on what I'm saying, I'm saying 0% of people are thinking about you during sex with you. <laughs> But I was with my ex for so long, I wanted to figure out what it would take to get her off without the magic wand, you know? Because I didn't want my job replaced by a robot, you know? <laughs> I wanted some job security. I didn't want every night to be like a threesome between me, her, and C-3PO. <laughs> so she taught me her process, like how to get her off acoustically. It's very complicated. I had to perform like a very specific Super 8-like pattern on a clitoris with my tongue. Not too light, but not too hard. For an extended period of time. I don't know, 20 minutes to two hours to two days. Then I had to twist her nipple counterclockwise. Then with my other hand, I had to choke her. Then miraculously, I had to grow a third arm and slap her in the face, the book, her third grade crush gave her. Then she'd finally start yelling out, oh baby, I like it, I like it, I like it. Dude, I was down there for so long, I finally had enough time to think of all the reasons we should break up. It's like, yeah, she got off, she came. But I also came to my senses. Hey, you guys have been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.